Welcome to the Binge Breakers Podcast. I'm Jacqueline. I am here to teach you how I overcame bulimia and my binge eating disorder and how you can too. Through simple steps of mind management, repairing your relationship with yourself, understanding your habits, and intuitive eating. Disclaimer, this recording is not intended to be utilized as medical advice or a medical diagnosis. If you think you're in need of medical attention or treatment, please seek it immediately. This recording will also contain sensitive subjects such as binging and purging, weight and depression. Please listen at your own discretion and do what you think is best for you. Hi everyone, welcome to the podcast. Today I have a special guest, Molly Zeraldo. And she is not only just a sweet, kind soul, she's such a deep thinker. And I think that'll become very apparent to you just a few minutes, if not the first time she speaks in the call. We cover everything to her eating disorder journey and what it was like, the rock bottom that she hit during it that kind of catapulted the changes in her life, what she's doing now, traveling around the world, doing lots of crazy stuff like that. And one of the biggest topics we wanted to talk about was human design. And not only how human design can just help you in your life in general, but the correlations you might find to eating design and eating disorders, or human design and eating disorders. Apologies. So definitely give this interview a lesson. I really love everything that Molly has to say, which is obviously why I brought her on. You can find her Instagram and her website below if you're interested in finding out more about her. Okay. Thanks everyone for listening. Also, quickly, personal update, I'll be at EDC Orlando this weekend. So if any of you guys are there by a slim chance, who knows, it's a small world, hit me up. I'll be there all Saturday um, and I'm totally down to meet any of you guys. So if I see you there or you see me there, please give me a wave. Um, Anyway, otherwise, I hope you guys are doing wonderful. Enjoy the episode. Bye. Yesterday I was, I got halfway through it, but I was listening to the interview with Seth Oh, okay. All he right. is, I think, and you, but like, he's one of the, my favorite voices in this space. Like Aww. his posts are just like, you, you know, like you just know when the people, he said it in the thing, but you know, when someone has struggled with it themselves, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I, under, I, I, like, I get so completely where he comes from with the body, like the chemistry in our physical body versus like all the intuitive eating that's out there it's yeah and I had no idea that he went through that part of his journey after his interview with you Mm -hmm. yeah I think that's so authentic like that happens with many of us to be honest like even when I was coaching I was like in the very beginning I was it's like it's like it comes up to like test test like are you ready to like really go like forward Mm -hmm. with this it brings so, yeah. up all your insecurities, right? Mm-hmm. Even if you aren't necessarily struggling with something, it's like, well, here's where you put your money where your mouth is. Yeah. As if as if you need to be perfect to be a coach too. It's like the yeah. most ridiculous expectation. And something you said about Seth, where it's like, he sounds so authentic. When we were talking together, it's kind of like, you need, you, even though you're struggling, you need to put this out there because people exactly. will, like- they'll read this, they'll know it. And I remember I, I always wanted to do that myself. Like I was like, when I get better, then I'll talk about it. When I'll get, when I get better, then I'll talk about it. Mm-hmm. And I remember being in a therapy session and my therapist who I adored, like, I just thought she was amazing. And she said that she helped more people with alcoholism in like a certain period of time in her life um, than she ever had. And she herself was drinking every day at night. You know what I mean? So she's wow. like, she's like, just because I was going, doesn't mean that I couldn't show up for someone else. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I think sometimes you don't have to like put all that out to the clients you're working with, but like, you know what they're going through. You know what I mean? It's the best, it's the best medicine, but yeah, I just, I love his post so much. Yeah. Cause he just, you can tell he's such a deep thinker. He thinks about it so much. <laughs> yeah. But I appreciate it because I came from the same a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I we're already recording. I always do that right off the bat because it like yeah. it's juicy conversations. But I obviously wanted to at first ask you about your story. Like what's your yeah, background with I know. eating disorders and whatnot? I also oh for people listening, this is Molly. She's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have her in the description below. Oh, I remember still voice noting you like when I was just like, I don't know what to do. Like, do I, do I go all in on bulimia or do I, do I make it more, um, you know, 
widespread with just eating disorder specific, but I have such a passion specifically for bulimia because I think it's such a tricky thing to tackle and it's mm-hmm. so invisible and it, there's so much shame around it, but God, okay. My story, I'm trying to think where to like begin with it. Um, yeah. So I grew up figure skating and in gymnastics. So in two sports that are like heavily, there's a lot of emphasis on your body skating. A lot of people think that was the catalyst for why I developed an eating disorder. And it really wasn't, it was actually like, I was always quite healthy and it was more. So I did have comments in gymnastics, not in skating, but in the gymnastics line, I was told a few times very, very early. And so I was very hyper aware and I was never really happy with my body from a very young age. We're talking like eight, nine years old. Oh, wow. And, and the real catalyst for the eating disorder and more, it, it, it kind of began as binging. And then I, you know, this sounds so horrible to say, but I'm sure a lot of your listeners that began this journey can empath- like be empathetic towards this statement is that is I desired the ability to throw up. You know what I mean? I was mm. binging and I was like, oh, if I could just get rid of this and I never could. And I would just have really unhealthy eating habits. But when all that spurred, like what spurred that on was when my skating kind of stopped, never stopped. I was still skated, but I went through puberty and my skating, my ability was never the same. And so the joy and the fulfillment and just the life that I had as a figure skater, that identity piece that everyone, you know, that that when we lose that specific identity in us. I had nowhere to turn and I didn't speak up about what I was going through. And so this is when all like the eating in secret began. Um, mm. Fast forward, it just like, yeah, it never really stopped. I went through, I was always able to keep it under wraps. Um, I went away to university and that's when it was really, really bad. In high school, it was like, yeah, I was going through suicidal periods, always in secret and always maintaining a lot of high level of success. So, you know, good in school, still doing my skating, still at a high level, but in the background, I was, I was a shell of a human. Like I was so, yeah, as we all are, you know, a lot of us can, that's the thing with bulimia is that you always, well, I shouldn't say this with all mental health, you can look completely a-okay, if not sometimes better off than most and be really, Sometimes really struggling. You look like you're doing amazing yeah exactly and I do find yeah. that I'll, yeah we don't want to like um stereotype but a lot of people I work with they tend to be like over high achievers exactly. so many ways and yet there's this thing in their life that are in secret like you're talking about and feeling like a shell of a human being so yeah so yeah so where do I then yeah all through university and then I skated for Disney on ice so I went and did it professionally. And that's actually one of the best times I had, I was still binging and purging every now and then, but for the most part, that joy that I had lost and that identity came back and I was like feeling okay again. And I was around people. And a lot of times that is always like, you know, bulimia is a very secretive thing. And I was living with someone in, in hotels and on tour that, you know, there was no keeping that a secret. Um, I did that. I studied abroad after that. Still, it was lingering in the background. And then I came home from all of these experiences and kind of hit a rock bottom. And it all came back up. And I remember reading, I was reading um, Marion Williamson's The Return to Love. And that was my first kind of interaction with the concept of surrender. And I think I had tried to get better on my own. I can't like the, the amount of broken promises is just, mm-hmm. it, it, you can't even keep like, it's just, I, every Monday I was like, I'm, I'm going to get better. I'm never going to throw up again. I'm, you know what I mean? And it was over and over and over again. And I was like, I can't do this. Like, I just, I can't, I had a small, small stint at an eating disorder clinic in high school, but I stopped going. Um, and I just said like, you know, God, universe, whatever, like, I can't do it anymore. And um, I'm quite open about my rock bottom moment. And it was a DUI. So Mm. I was working in the wine industry. And I came home from an event and was pulled over. And everything kind of came crashing down. Like my I was so full of shame that that is such a 
embarrassing thing to have happen. Mm -hmm. I lost my job. I was stuck at home at my parents' house. I couldn't drive for at least a year. I didn't want anyone to know. I didn't want to be around my friends. I didn't want to. And I just, it was that dark, you know, I hate that dark night of the soul and all of that. But I, it was just like, you think the bulimia days were hard. Like that just was like, what am I, what's going on with my life? Mm -hmm. And, um, because I couldn't leave the house, I like deep dove into all of that work. So I think when we're like ready, all those teachers start appearing and I just started to like, okay, like start meditating, start moving in, in a way that's just for, to get in touch with my body and to kind of move this energy and not move to lose weight. And just, I just deep dove into that world because I had nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, on a whim, I decided to move to Australia. And then from there, slowly things on got better. On a whim, so really. <laughs> I had a friend, I had a friend message me because she knew I, I was like, I need to move to a city because I lived kind of out in the country. And um, I was like, I have to move to a place where I don't need a car. And so I was like, do I go? I'm in from Canada. So I was like, do I go to Toronto? I was even thinking of like Calgary or Vancouver. And then I had a friend say, I need a roommate in Australia. And like, I maxed out my credit card. I had no money. I had enough money to give her two weeks worth of rent landed oh, wow. and just like got a restaurant job two days later. And just was like, sometimes when you don't have that net, that safety net, you like, you just have to make it work. Mm -hmm. And slowly, but surely a lot of things fell into place in Australia and I ended up staying there and getting a good job in the tech industry, which was a whole other path. But, um, I encountered and had the means and, you know, cause a lot of it's fine financial, you know, stuff mm -hmm. to get help and to go to healers. And I started to explore a lot of different modalities and, um, I, yeah, a lot of my healing just started to solidify, started to understand for the, I think up until I went to Australia, if you asked me, why do you have bulimia? I wouldn't have been able to tell you why. And so I just started to understand that like it was filling such a void that, you know, I was numbing, that I was actually sensitive. I had no idea that I was a sensitive person. Like I, and all of this was like brand new to me. And yeah, so long story short, I, that, that happened when I was, that move to Australia happened when I was 20, sorry, 28, I think, or 29. Okay. Um, I'm now, I'm now 36. So I spent some time in Australia, moved back home, lived in Toronto and yeah, I got really, I, I still had always that corporate job, but on the side, I always had other things going. So I became a yoga teacher. I ended up publishing a poetry book about my recovery and slowly, very, very slowly. It's so scary, but I began to talk about it and post about it. Um, and then a blessing in disguise was I lost my job due to COVID. And that's when mm -hmm. I got into coaching. That's when I decided to just be like, okay, this is what I want to do. You know, like our wounds can be where we are of service. You know, it's like, I went through this for a reason. And I always thought that I always was like, I'm go. I want to get better so that I can help someone else get better. I always, always, always wanted to do that. Um, and so, yeah, so that all led me into this, what I do now. And when I was coaching, I wanted to find out what my clients, uh, their human design chart was, because mm -hmm. I had a reading years ago. And I thought there was some, um, I was curious myself to see if there was a correlation. And then when I got into human design, that kind of, I got more busy getting readings than I was with clients. And it kind of just took on a life of its own. And so now I primarily do human design readings yeah mm -hmm. well that's, that's a very happens, complicated so. story I think. no I think I was thinking like man if if we just stopped the episode here I feel like so many people would get so much value from that because the story you were telling like it started from a very young period you can really really understand what's going on but I think a lot of people can relate to that loss of identity and that's where um well my first eating disorder started when I was in high school uh, mm. period of eating disorders I had switched schools loss of identity you know and that sort of thing and it just kind of being able to fall deeply into eating disorders and that sort of stuff and then the same thing when I came back from traveling abroad that's when I fell again really deeply mm. into bulimia so it's just interesting the correlation there 
but also, I don't know, there, I wish I could just like play it back, but um, something you said that was really interesting, which is when you were in that really dark period, you know, and I love that you're open with sharing that because that happens to a lot of people. And I think in society, we obviously like demonize DUIs and stuff like that. And they're, it's not the best to have that happen, but when you're in a dark period where you kind of have everything stripped away from you and you're talking mm. about the concept of surrender, that is when you are, like you said, being open to actually finding people. Because there was so many periods in my life too where the help was there and the answers were there, but I wasn't, I was not in a place to hear it. And I didn't believe it and I didn't really want to. And mm. so I love that you shared that space because a lot of people have gone through something like that and they're like, how could you ever recover? And look at you, you know, you have gone completely 180 and gotten through that and, and surpassed that. And it's just, I don't know, it's inspiring. It's inspiring to hear. So thank you for sharing all that. Yeah. I think, yeah, like the quote that popped into my head when you were speaking was like, when the student is ready, the teacher appears because in a way, like, I know one of the hardest things about recovery is that sometimes like when we're really, 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 really honest with ourselves, there's still this part of us that doesn't actually want to recover. It's this weird, it's this really weird thing that like, and it it is, it's also linked to that identity. It's like, I can't let go of this only safe thing that I know. And it's Mm -hmm. like, it is so hard to let go of this thing that like we think of, think of as love. And um, yeah, I think there is a lot of times when I said, I want to get better. I want to get better. But like maybe underneath that, I didn't, you know, there was a part when I think that there is something to be said about like sometimes, you know, and we still kind of engage in those behaviors because in some weird way, it's serving us in some way. Yeah. It, it oh, may not sorry. be healthy. That's okay. <laughs> but um, it's so tricky and it's just like for anyone that's on their journey, it's just like, you just can't keep, like, you just can't give up. You just have to keep going because it's like, I've, I've spoken about this a lot and I worked for a short period of time with an eating disorder specific coach that was um, a student of Carolyn Costin. Are you familiar with her work in the eight keys? Um, I know of her, but I'm not as familiar as I should be. Yeah. So that was the eight keys for me. If anyone is listening and they can't afford anything, that book, if you can get your hands on that book and take yourself through those chapters, there are exercises. Like it's a, it is basically my coach just walked me through that book. And um, where was I going with this? The spiral. So yeah, there were times when I was way, way, way. When I, when I look at my recovery, I was at the last, last stages, like, I was so far along, but in my head, I was still struggling. So I just said, you know, you think you're right in the thick of it. And um, I was showing up for these calls and every week I was coming back and saying the same thing to her. Like, yep, I've binged and like, you know, same Mm -hmm. story. And she said, you've got to think of it like a spiral. Like every time you're down, you're not actually like just back in the same spot you're you're always continuously moving up and out and up and out and up and out and eventually you'll get out but when we're down it feels like you're just down and you're low and you're right back where you were but you never really are because there's like if you're willing to learn it there's a new lesson you don't want to look at it because you're like this is the same thing like you know you're like you think you know the lesson but like allow yourself the patience and the compassion to sit with like okay why did I binge like get really, really deep. And like, there's always something new there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It does feel like Groundhog Day and it's oh so my God, easy to yes. fall into that. And, but I love that, that actual visual example because that yeah, is what it me is. me too. Like, it helped me so much. It, it's so hard to tell people when they've just binged being like, actually you've made improvements actually you've done these things they're like yeah okay thanks thank you Jacqueline you know but they but they really have and you've learned things and it's it's hard to want to look at those lessons but if you can have patience with yourself like you're saying and just being aware which is like the most cliche thing ever and I hate when people say it because it's said so often but if you can be aware in those moments and still have presence instead of just shutting yourself out and saying we're back to square one. I think that can, that can help you keep continuing on that spiral that you're talking about. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But okay. I wanted to ask you, cause I know the, the main reason Molly and I, well, we started talking a long time ago. Right. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah. the reason that we wanted to come on here is cause you obviously have found a passion for human design and personally, I don't know that much about human design. So one reason I wanted to bring Molly on was that she's just a kind soul and her Instagram is like, if you go to it, it just feels like a safe, nice place full of wisdom. So that's one reason. And then um, obviously you have a lot to share. But then secondly, I'm just very curious about the human design. And you said there's correlations between that and eating disorders. So first right. of all, what is human design, Molly? <laughs> yeah, <tell> yeah. <laughs> so human design is kind of a mix of a lot of different modalities. I think most people are familiar with astrology and what astrology is and what their sign is. So there is a mix of astrology, the I Ching, Kabbalah, even the chakra system um, when you're looking at human design. And so I'd had a reading like years and years and years ago. And I think what I enjoyed about it was it, it gives a little bit more of like a tangible physical aspect in terms of our physical energy and I think a lot of people that struggle with eating disorders, we are like sensitive. And I think that was a big thing for me to realize. I think there's a lot of books that even speak to how we struggle to be in the physical body. And so there's a lot in human design that speaks about how we relate to others' energies, how we take on people's energies, and all of this can affect us. And I think, um, realizing there was a part of my chart that would like made me really understand how I had such a hard time feeling feelings. Um, and so, yeah, I, hopefully that's like describes a little bit about human design. And then there are five types. So yes, in astrology, there's like, well, there's lots of Zodiac signs, but in, in human design, there's only five. And so everyone on the planet, according to human design would fall into one of these five categories and each one kind of has their quintessential characteristics. And then in someone's chart, there's a lot of different energies that make them more specific. So no two charts are going to be the exact same. But overall, there's overarching themes for the five types. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I like those types of things are really interesting because I think we all we always like to put things into categories. But I've heard a lot of people who have talked about human design feel like you, what you've been saying, which is it kind of gives you an answer as to why you might be behaving in such a way or reacting in such a way. And I can also strongly relate to the idea of being overly, not overly, but just sensitive, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the term that you said, which is we struggle to be in a physical body, mm -hmm. very strongly relate to that because it just feels like there's so much stimulation sometimes going on. It's like, uh, you just want to be silenced. So how did like, how do you apply human design to helping people? If that question makes any sense. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. I think, you know, sometimes I get on calls and I'm just like, was that enough? Like, did I give enough? Did that really help enough? And people are always so appreciative because at the end of the day, I think the number one thing is people want to feel seen and understood. And I think it allows themselves to see themselves more clearly. But the one word that always pops up for me and what it was for me was a permission slip. It was like, that is why I am the way that I am. And I don't need to beat myself up because I am a manifesting generator and they are meant to be very multi-passionate. So you can see like I skated and I was in the wine industry mm -hmm. and I did eating disorder and then I'm doing human design. Like to the outside world, it's like, Molly, just pick one thing, like just focus. And my path is very non-linear. And this is what a manifesting generator's path typically looks like. And so when I found that out, I was like, oh, I don't have to just pick one thing. Like, it's normal that mm -hmm. I have so many passions. And even before eating disorder and human design, it was like, I was into fashion. And while it was like, always, I always had so many things that I wanted to do. And um, it was a permission slip. And it also just, I think, yeah, I think self-development, we can all, it's endless learning about ourselves and we grow and we change and we evolve too. But 
it's just, and I also want to not put it like put it as this end all be all because it's just one small modality and there are so many out there, you know, and there are so many different things that help us to he heal. There isn't one, I, for me anyways, not one solution that's going to tick the box, but right. um, it's just, yeah, I think it allows you to know yourself better. And that's, I think how it helps. Every, and, and maybe it helps you to understand like that. Yeah. That's the way that I am, or that's why I struggle with that. Or this is why sometimes it's, there are these negative things that can pop up in someone's chart, not negative, but like there's a lot of fears that are, that are in us. And mm. you can kind of pinpoint those in someone's chart being like fear of failure is really going to be strong for this person or fear of like not feeling enough or, you know, fear of like, Oh, my past is going to, my patterns are going to keep repeating and I'm never going to get better. So you can kind of get like very specific on like, Hey, what can I, what can I do to combat this? Um, and like, yeah, you just, it gives you like, oh, that's what, that's why I am the way that I am. But what I will also want to do on calls is always offer, like, how can we remedy this? Like, you know, if, if it is difficult for you to ground into your body, like how, how can we do that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. I really like the idea of the permission slip because so, so many people are the way that they are. Right. And there's not a huge problem with it, but because of what they see in society, but they're, they're comparing themselves to their best friend, Stacy, like whatever. Yeah, and they just yeah. think like, I'm not that way. I should be this way. And really it's not a big deal. And I don't, I forget, actually, I should have looked this up before. I forgot what you told me I was, but I know oh, that I can have, some... I have your chart. Oh um, yeah. Sure, it yeah. Before, Molly was yeah. kind enough to do um, like a, a brief reading on my chart and everything like that. But I was going to say that I don't, I'm not, obviously I'm not a multi generator, like you said, but I also have a lot of different passions and sometimes I feel bad because yeah. I can't be as focused. And so it's like, oh, it's nice to know that that's okay. And it's not going to cause anyone any harm. We just, we're so hard on ourselves for no yeah. apparent reason. <laughs> yeah. And just comparison. embracing, yeah, like who we are and just being comfortable with who we are. You know, it's, I think like, I try, like, I did this um, exercise years and years and years ago, of, like, what is your purpose? And like, you know, it asked you all these questions. And at the time, I still, I wasn't out about having an eating disorder, but it was always like, I want to help people with an eating disorder. But when I got underneath all of the layers, it was like, I just wanted to help people to feel like it was okay to be themselves. Because even I still struggle. Like, when I post something, I'm like, oh, that was so stupid. Or, you know, like, I still the fear of what other people think of me is the biggest thing for me like mm -hmm. you know and I think so many of us if we didn't care what anyone thought like I just like when I wonder what the world would look like I wonder what we would be doing you know if oh we just goodness. didn't care if we <laughs> yeah. like followed really what we wanted to do and didn't be like all oh, this you know my parents won't approve of this or this is again my friends will think I'm crazy um, mm -hmm. it's just so like sad for me. not sad, like we all go through it, but it's just like, that is like what I want to do, but it's, I, it's difficult for me even to do it. Yeah. Yeah. No, putting yourself out there is hard. Um, I think I actually had a dream that I posted something the other night and I got a bunch of nasty comments on it. Really? Um, and it's, it's just scary because you associate if people question you in any way. I think part of it's hard because sometimes they question you and maybe there's like a hint of truth of what they're saying and then you you blow that out of proportion but also it just feels dangerous people don't like you you're like what yeah we always hate me? That. yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah how did so, you I have a question for you like mm -hmm. what was the catalyst for you like coming out about having an eating disorder and like those first few posts of like I'm a coach for bulimia like what was that like Oh God. The, so the first, the first post I made was actually on my face, my personal Facebook page, all my family and friends. And oh my God, I point, cried the first time I did that. I was yeah. so nervous. I cried. <laughs> yeah, me too. I will like a few, like a month or so before I, I was already wanting, I was already coaching and wanting to be a coach. Right. And right, I was like right. coaching a few people just on general topics. And I was talking to 
my coach at the time about like, I think I should do eating disorders basically. Yeah. And, and then I was like, but that would be weird. And, and she's like, why would it be weird? And she kept just like questioning me. And then I, I started crying and I was like, I don't want to do it. People are going to judge me. And at that point, only my boyfriend and two of my friends knew about my eating disorder. My parents didn't know anyone. And so I, I knew that if I wanted to t- help people with eating disorders, I had to put that beacon out, right. Of being like, yeah, hey, you're else no they can't find it. you. Yeah. Yeah. So otherwise like no one's <laughs> be under a rock. And so I posted yeah. it to my family and friends and I, I had so many thoughts of like, everyone's going to judge me. They're going to think I'm weird. And and maybe they're going to think I'm a liar. Maybe they're going to think I'm disturbed. I don't know. And it just showed me how much shame I still had around my eating disorder, right, even though I had right. recovered. But then I posted it. And of course, everyone was as friendly as possible. And I made a lot of connections that way. And so many friends reach out to me that are actually struggling themselves. And wow. it's like, oh, when, when you put yourself out there, even though there can be haters, and I've certainly gotten those since that time, but it's it's helped a lot more people than what those few people that don't like it. Oh, a hundred percent. That, mm-hmm. that is such a good point. Like for the one person that it helps, it's worth the 10 that like, not even that they would judge you, but you know what I mean? But like, mm-hmm. that just like, who cares what they think if, if it helps one person, like that's often what I'll think about when I post, like if this just resonates with one person, it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a yeah. predominant thought for me too, especially yeah. if I'm having that dragging my feet moment or I'm like, no, this is stupid. No one's even yes. like, everyone knows yeah. this. That's a common thing. I'm yeah. like, everyone already knows what I have to say, but I'm like, no, this will help one person. Yeah. Um, there's someone out here out there that needs to hear this. And that usually gets me over my personal yeah. shit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, how does, yeah. um, so with human design, you said there are correlations with with human design and then eating disorders. Can yeah. you speak a little bit more to that? I know one of you, one of them was that you said some of us can be like sensitive. So, yeah, it's funny because I, I say yes and no to this, <laughs> but so when I got into it, my first few clients, I was looking at their charts and I started to see like a similar pattern. And then all of a sudden I didn't. So I was like, okay, there is no like one one thing when I first looked into this concept because I was actually going to focus eat my human design reading around eating disorder because there's so many human design reader, readers I was like how can I differentiate myself and I remember reading a post about if you had two different lines in your chart that made you very susceptible to body image issues and mm-hmm. I would again I'd get clients who didn't have them and I was like there really is no like hard and fast, if you have this, you will have develop an eating disorder. What I think it is, is that there is a correlation here and just like helping us that struggle with eating, maybe pointing a pointing like lighter, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> like uh, shining a light on, yeah, enlightening um, the aspects that might be like deep, deep, roots of the wound, you know, or, um, areas to focus our healing or root causes, I guess you should say, because like at the end of the day, I think eating disorders, like addiction is addiction, right? Like it's anything we, we reach for outside of ourselves to soothe and to numb. So just because we say eating disorders, there is a court, you know, there's a lot of people that have a lot of different addictions and it doesn't mean that you know, human design can't help them either. It's just, it's informing us of like, why might I be reaching for food? You know, like, what is it in my body? Um, And so I think that it helps, yeah, point to deeper wounds and also ways that can maybe help heal. Like for me, um, yoga was a big, like another big modality that helped connect like my mind to my body. Mm-hmm. but there's a lot of in people's charts sometimes that are like, okay, like a grounding exercise is going to be like, you've got to prioritize this, you know, like, or, you know, some sort of physical exercise to pull you down from the mind and back into the physical body, like needs to be like really important for you. So sometimes it can just inform also, like, what are maybe some key elements that I need to help 
get me along on my journey or like my, what might be things that are helpful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if that, that, yeah. that helps. No, that, that makes sense. Well, you kind of went into like, it can cover human design can really answer a lot of questions and root issues where with what your eating disorder or any other thing you're struggling with might have. Yeah. 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 Related to. Right. But then also I love that you said like, it can point out different modalities to help. And some people yoga or yoga and meditation are two different things. So I don't want to throw them in the same box, but let's mm-hmm. say like meditation, the traditional thing we think of where you just sit cross-legged and like, Oh, you know, um, mm-hmm. that can be really helpful for some people, but then some people it's like, a torture chamber, right? And mm-hmm. you have like so many things going on in your mind. So it makes sense that human design might point out better modalities for different people, which yeah. Makes sense. But yeah, like there's some, like I'm just thinking of an example in my mind of um, like there's some that there's a lot of artistry or creativity in their chart and they might not be doing any of that. And so that might be a call to like, let's like cultivate that in you again like let's bring back that let's use that as a way to fill the void that food might be doing you know and and kind of reawakening these parts of ourselves that we might have like forgotten about that if we did them like I you you wrote a newsletter the other day I forget like about like when we live life like you when you really have a full life or something like get out there Mm -hmm. living life and that kind of your bulimia and your eating disorder begins to subside and I couldn't agree with that more because when you're in recovery like I have an interesting guy I used to think about this a lot in my head of like what we think about grows or what we give our attention to is what we see the most of and so I was just like oh, like recovery, I hate it because you have to give it all this attention and you do have to work at it and you got to like do the exercises and the reflection and the journaling and whatever it is that you're working through. But then it's like, when you just get so busy living life, you forget about it. And then oftentimes like it goes away for a week and you're like, oh my God, I was like been free for a week. And like, it was because I was so engaged with something else, you know? So yeah, sometimes I think it's like, maybe like, yeah, like getting back into art or getting back into music or something like that. It's, it can kind of be a distract, a good distraction of yeah, pulling us dis- out. Yeah. Distractions aren't uh, in, in the self-help space. And I think the feeling you're feeling space, there's a lot of like, feel everything. Don't ever distract yourself, face the problem head on. And of course there's a time and space for that because if you're just completely ignoring the problem, it might not ever go away. I mean, maybe it will, but most likely not. Uh, but then there are time, there's a time and place for healthy distractions and actually letting your passion grow for that. Because, you know, as you said, and I said, in my newsletter, like recovery can almost become your whole life and you don't oh want my that. God, yes. like, yeah, yeah. And we all get in that phase. And then you start thinking things like, this sucks. It takes up so much effort. I have to stop my whole life in order to recover. And it depends on where you are and how bad I want to say you are into bulimia. Like maybe you do need to stop your life for a little bit and go to a treatment center. Um, But then after that, like you really need to have other areas of your life. Recovery is one of them, but there needs to be multiple. Otherwise recovery will just suffocate you. Right. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so with trying to think, do I have any other questions about human design? Oh, um, so can you, I'm just kind of curious for my own personal, um, what, um, what is the projector again? It's been a while since I looked at that voice message. Yeah. So the projectors are the gift that they have is this, this bird's eye view, so to speak. So they have a very unique perspective on the world. So sometimes like there's a a metaphor of like they're a bird in the tree and they can spot like inefficiencies and they see just how things can be done better, how processes, how methods can be improved. And they're meant to sweep down, like swoop down, tell us that improvement and then go back up to their tree. They're not really meant to like, like roll up their sleeves and hustle like the generators of the world. So they really are like a new age leader, so to speak. They, they're like the wise guides. And so they have a lot of wisdom within them that needs to be pulled out of them. Um, but they have, yeah, what it is, it's just they have a very unique way of seeing things. And they usually, um, 
have a gift of seeing how certain things can be improved, how, how something can be tweaked so that they can just be, be made better. Mm, okay, cool. So for but, you, like, yeah, like it could be a new take on like, yeah, like how you work with people. Like you might just be like, it should be done like this. Like, like, you know, yeah. recovery, recovery can be like this. So just offering, it's like your spin on it. Mm-hmm. Mm. So when you, when you say that, I, it, it first is flattering. I'm like, Oh, so why is everything like that? <laughs> then I'm like, wait, that doesn't like part of it. I'm like, oh, I'm not that wise, you know, I'm just a freaking human being. Right. So what would you say to people who they feel like the label that they've gotten in human design is putting them into a box, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the, that concept of being put into a box is actually like, within the human design centers within there's a center called the identity center um and when it's open meaning it's not colored in in your chart these people even though you could be a projector there are people that are very chameleon like they're so adaptable they can wear multiple different hats and so it's interesting like the flavor of like your chart and this overarching term but if people sorry so the question was like if people don't really relate to being that yeah, like what well, I'm I'm just I know there are people out there listening who can be skeptical, do, right? Right. Oh, a thousand mm-hmm. percent. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I would and I would hope, yeah. Go ahead. I would yeah, I think when it comes to like just trying, trying it on for size, like what if you did see yourself as wise? What if you did give yourself more credit where credit mm-hmm. is due? That's good. You know what I mean? Because all of the ways that the types are described, they're very like flattering. Like every time people read mm-hmm. through them, it's like, I think I'm that one. I think I'm that one. Um, there's po- there's no good or bad one. And so just like seeing, because a lot of times we don't even acknowledge the gifts that we have, or we don't, they come so easily to us that we don't even realize that they're a gift or like, oh, I, I, this comes so easily to me. It doesn't come this easily to everybody else or, or just trying on for size. Like, what would it be like if I embodied like, and, and really felt like I have a lot of knowledge to give this world, you know, like, I don't, I never feel like that, but like, what if I actually did? Um, and just, mm-hmm. yeah, just like experimenting with it. And that's what it, it really is, is a lot of times often referred to. It's just a human design experiment. Like, you know, it's, it's trying different things because one of the elements that we didn't go into is that each type then has a strategy and an authority and the strategy and the authority are really informing us how to move through the world, how to make decisions, how, what to say yes to, what to say no to. And that is all experimenting, you know, like I'm still working with my strategy, which is to respond and how, how do I, go about doing that and yours is unique yours is um waiting for the invitation so oh, yeah it's, yeah so that it's just all like um practice and only if it if it's if not not even if it speaks to you but if there's no curiosity there then leave it you know what i mean like with all with everything in the in the self-help space like take what resonates and leave what doesn't like one mm. thousand percent yeah yeah i'm hearing that I've been trying to put that more in my messaging as well, because there are certain things that I'm saying that hundred percent work for people, but then there, there may be some people where it just doesn't work for. And I don't want those oh, people yeah. to keep on like pushing into a wall and being like, well, what well, these people can do it. And it's like, maybe you need something slightly different. Maybe you need to tweak and yeah. so take what works, leave the rest and keep on going on your journey. Yeah. I think with recovery as well, it's like, um, I'm trying to think of the word, like it's a mix and match, you know, like we take all these little pieces along the way and the recovery journey looks so different for everyone, at least from, from what I see, you know, Mm because no two people are alike. No two people are going to heal at the same rate. No two people are going to, to like do as well with certain modalities and, and the same type of therapy. So even when you're on your recovery journey, like if something worked and then it didn't like be open to trying something new, like don't just give up if that didn't work for you because something out there will, will click. And even if it's not the like for me, it was like so many little things together. It wasn't just one thing. Right. Yeah. I know what you person. mean by click. Cause like yeah. there's, 
there's so many different methods that come into one and then you feel like sometimes you have a big moment or like everything you've learned, all the little clicks on the aha the moments, yeah. create a big click. And you're like, I yes. get it. That yeah. was like, that was the pause for me, the pause method that I talk about after so many years of like not getting it and piecing together little moments and like brain over binge and all that sort of stuff. So, but also you talked about like the human experiment and, and the idea of think of my thoughts straight there's like so, again there's so much you're saying that's like there's cool so value much that I'm like, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh um, I think looking at it as an experiment and especially what you said about like what if you are I think that's such a cool idea because even if you look at the, the human design and you're like some of these pieces make sense some of it doesn't asking right. yourself well what if I could be that that opens up a whole world for you and it's so exciting because even, even if human design is maybe like labeling you, whatever you label yourself all the time. And it's just this thing that you put on yourself. So it sounds comforting to me and expansive to take on the concept of something new and playing with that idea. Because if you kind of dabble with your mind with that idea, you can open the possibility and then start making more decisions from that place. It sounds ludicrous. When I first heard this sort of stuff, I was like, there's no way I just am what I am but really mm-hmm. your thoughts can change so much about you. So I, I love that you said that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And for others, like, I know like this stuff might seem so crazy now. And then who knows, maybe two years you're like, huh? Oh, like now I'm ready for it. You know, like we're not always, I think it relates back to like, I like even from as simple as like, I remember years ago being handed, oh, what's that Eckhart Tolle book? Um, the very first one he wrote, but there's things that we'll get, like we'll come across our path and it's just like, we're not there yet. Like, you know what I mean? Like, and if it is just like, no, it's, I'm not, it's not my time to, to dive into this. Um, yeah. Just like carry on, but it's always, there's always something out there. And if, if it, you know, piques your interest, like have a look into it. And yeah, if not, mm-hmm doesn't have to to be something well you weren't always a human design expert right (laughs) no no yeah and then you start dabbling into it and like you said you know when you're ready the teacher appears and that really rings true in this subject too so tell me really quickly and I know we're we're getting I'm running out of time but what is strategy and authority again what are those two terms yeah so this so each type has a strategy and it's kind of informs them on kind of how to move through the world and that's such a blanket term but like how to to move forward um how to make decisions and they're tricky so i can just explain really quickly so the generators and the manifesting generators respond and that's because when they're doing things that light them up they're meant to be very magnetic and they're meant to like almost draw and attract things toward them and then they respond mm-hmm. by saying yes or no to, to whatever's come across them. You know, like, yes, I do want to engage with that. Nope, that's not for me. So they're constantly in this process of responding to what the physical, you know, realm has brought them. For a projector, there, there's, a, there's this, like, it takes a little bit more patience because they hold such wisdom within them. Oh, and this is what we also didn't speak about. Um, they are less quote unquote, they, they don't get the same amount of energy as the generators. So they need more rest Mm -hmm. and they need more time to just rejuvenate. So waiting for the invitation also helps them to kind of conserve their energy. So they're not always just giving all this wisdom out like boom, 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 but they're waiting for the invitation, meaning that when they actually speak, it's been asked of them. It's been, okay, what is your input? What is your insight? What is your advice? So it's really important for them to wait for the invitation when there's that exchange of their wisdom. They don't have to wait for the invitation for everything in life, like to eat dinner, mm-hmm. to go to a friend's house. But when they're <laughs> offering up insight and wisdom, it's really important that it's been kind of pulled out of them, so to speak, because then when it it has the space to land with that person. It has the, it has the ability to actually be implemented and make the impact that it's meant to have. Um, manifestors are the lucky ones. They just get to go and do whatever they want. They're much more rare. Um, they're only, they're supposed like, you know, human design offers up these percentages and 
you know, oh, I looked it up how accurate you sent that to me. Yeah, like, projectors are about twenty percent. <laughs> yeah, so it's more yeah. rare. Projectors are about twenty percent, and then manifestors is about eight to nine percent of the population. And because they really are here to create and lead and like create what never existed, when they get an idea, when they get an urge, they're just meant to go. And the less they ask for someone's input, the less they're like, "Do you think this is a good idea?" and just go the more powerful they are but we get so like we doubt ourselves and I love reading for manifestors because I just want to like empower them so much because they don't realize just how like powerful they are and then reflectors they have you know I one my best one of my best friends is a reflector and so it's been such a great thing for me to learn more intimately this type because they're, they are, they are, they are, they're the unicorn. They're supposedly one to 2% of the population and their entire chart, whenever, you know, someone looks up their chart after this, hearing this, they'll see a weird chart. I'm not sure if you looked it up. Um, I did. All these, yeah. yeah you know, it's, it's like, so what is happening? It's so weird. There's these triangles and squares and there's different things lit up. A reflector's chart is all white. So mm. they're really the most sensitive type but then they can be the strongest and the most powerful they're they're truly chameleons because where you're white or where you're open in your chart that's where you are sensitive to the environment around you that's where you're like a sponge and that's where you like kind of soak up energy so for them they can be like so 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 sensitive but then they can also be full of so much strength they they kind of experience the extremes Um, but the reflectors are really meant to reflect to us our truth they are like super wise beings they're the most intuitive of all of us Um, and they hold such special gifts and especially like the way their their health is actually very dependent upon the people around them as well like they're Mm -hmm. so sensitive to their environment that the moment that they might not be feeling well it's usually a sign of like I need to get into a new environment Um, Because they almost like reflect the health of those around them and the, and just kind of the vibe around them. Um, Mm -hmm. So yeah, they're very interesting. They're rare, but like I said, like, because I'm lucky to have have a a very, very good friend that's a reflector. It's been such an interesting process to see and to talk with her because their strategy is also difficult. They're they're considered moon beings. (laughs) This is also like woo woo. Okay. But they are meant to really be patient with their decision-making processes. And really, they're so in tune with the cycles of the moon that their opinions and their life can dramatically change in the course. You know, we all do these sometimes, like new moon intentions and letting go on the full moon. For them, those types of practices can be so supportive um, because they're supposed to make their decisions around the cycles of the moon as well. So mm. yeah, it's, it, it's interesting. So like I said, like it's all take it with a grain of salt and never even myself, like it's not the one thing I'm like, yes, human design. It's just been yeah. one modality of many, <laughs> many that I've tried that enough helped me along my way that I was like, it's worth sharing this if it if it helps someone yeah absolutely no I think it'll help a lot of people and even when you sent me that message again there were certain things I was like oh that makes sense like the energy thing I feel like I need the most ludicrous I'm so using ludicrous a lot but the most like an inordinate amount of rest ever yeah and I feel like I, sh- yeah. I shouldn't need that and I always compare it to like the people around me and Yet though, when I do things, it takes me shorter amounts of time to do them, I'm able to create things in like pretty succinct amounts. So it, it, but then I need lots of rest and I'm always like, why don't I just layer more on top of it? Why don't I just do yeah. more? And, but because you need yeah. that. And you've got uh, manifestors, projectors, and reflectors are the non-energy beings, meaning they can't, they don't have the ability to generate their own energy manifesting generators and generators do and they make up more than 60 percent of the population so so many people that don't fall into this generator category they are trying and wearing themselves out trying to keep up at the pace of the generator society and we live in a generator (laughs) society you know and and so many of us work nine to fives like we can't be like i cannot work you know the schedule we have to kind of make do with, with life, 
but just knowing like prioritize your rest, you know, make people around, you know, like, yeah, I can't keep up, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, that was, um, you know, I'm a generator and sometimes, and we can go into sometimes people that are generators don't resonate with having a lot of energy and that's a whole other thing, (laughs) but, um, just, yeah, when you're a projector, a manifester, a reflector rest is very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And just knowing like, oh, if you need a lot of rest, it it sounds simple knowing the reasons behind things, but it, like you said, it gives you that permission slip not to judge. And I think so many people are looking for that and they need, they need that knowledge to kind of piece it together and be like, oh, it's okay that I am this way. And it's not such a problem. It's, it's working with yourself and your strengths and weaknesses versus working against yourself and like ignoring all of your strengths and trying to like pinpoint all your weaknesses, which isn't helpful. That's so true. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's take, like take the gifts and just like build upon them and Mm -hmm. own them. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I feel like we could talk about this all day, but I know that we're getting close to the hour. So where can people find you at? Yes. Mostly it's just Instagram. So it's my full name. I Molly Zeraldo. I just mm-hmm. recently created a separate human design account, but they will Ooh. find it when they, yeah, because okay. it's very difficult because I'm manifesting generator. It's like, and, um, I often want to share just more personal stories and my writing and it, and it has nothing to do with human design. And I felt really weird having like these two things merging on one page. So I've done separate, if people want to learn more, like the tangible, like things about human design, I want to start sharing more about that on that page, but, Mm -hmm. um, myself and, and things like that. Yeah. You can find me on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to have to follow. I'm not following your human design account. So I'm going to, I literally, I think I, I made it like yesterday (laughs) (laughs) or or the day before. Yeah. (laughs) There's like, yeah, there's like yeah. 50 followers. Yeah. Well, it's kind of funny when you say that about, I I don't share, I share some personal things on my bulimia recovery account. I really don't share that much of my actual personal accounts, but at the same time, I like accounts that share a few different things. I guess there is that, that sometimes I follow something, someone for a specific thing and they're posting the exact opposite. And I'm like, what in the world but at the Mm. same time I like when accounts have more than one thing because it shows that they're humans I don't know I know it's nice to see different sides of them this is an interesting point of even though we're told to do something you don't have to do it because I remember Mm -hmm. listening to a podcast that was business coaching for human design So they got to the manifesting generator type and they're like, and if you're a manifesting generator, your Instagram page, just allow it to be whatever you want. You know what I mean? Like there doesn't have to be a rhyme or reason. Every post can be different. And I sat with that for years and I was like, and it just was like, never sat with me. It was like, no, I want Mm. to keep this separate because as you know, like now I'm like abroad and I'm traveling and I just feel like I want that account to be much more an expression of like my life and just my day to day. Whereas human design for me is more of like, um, like more of an informative page. I don't know. So yeah, like Mm -hmm. just, it's like, you know, we get all this, like you should be doing this. And it's like, no, I don't have to do this. (laughs) So make your own rules as you go. But um, yeah, I do agree with like, I've had, I even had people say to me, cause I had, you know, a much bigger following on the other page and they're like, mm-hmm. why start from scratch? I'm like, I don't know. And I waited for months and I'm like, I'm still going to do it. So I finally yeah. did it. Yeah. Yeah. You're allowed. Right. Yes. And good for yes. you. For, and the thing is, if it doesn't work out, you can always just like not use that page anymore. Right. If it right. absolutely for some reason bombs, you can be like, okay, well, we're done with that. I try. At least I but, tried. Yeah. Or else yeah I just you, all sit there. With, yeah. Thinking about mm-hmm. it to be to like a short story. And I want to ask you about what you're doing in Europe real quick. But, um, when I first started trying to do the coaching thing, I did, I was posting like life coaching, inspirational quotes on my personal Instagram. And I'm sure all my friends are like, what is going on with Jacqueline? Is she just like, she's all (laughs) enlightened now. I don't know what, I think, I think maybe a few people reach out and they're like, thank you for this. But Uh, otherwise my friends just kind of ignored it. And they're like, 
okay. <laughs> so I did, I did create a separate account for my bulimia recovery, which is now much bigger than my personal account. So it did work mm-hmm. out for me, but now the bulimia recovery account has become yours has grown so much. Yeah. Thank you. I think yeah. it's, it's from the podcast mainly. Right. It's very good a lot of people, but anyway, um, for you real quickly, if you feel comfortable sharing, what are you, are you just traveling around Europe yeah. for fun? Like what, what are you doing? Uh, so I had always had a dream of living in Europe. I have an Italian passport. Very, very lucky. It took me a long, it took me seven years to get it. I was determined. Wow. I'd studied in Italy fell in love with it. I feel very connected to like my lineage here in terms of like, I had a, a Nona that passed away when I was young and in weird ways I've, I've thought like, I, I'm going back to Italy for her. There's just a lot of, a lot of, a lot there. And so I've always wanted to move to Europe. And when I worked my corporate job in tech, um, I was going to transfer to our London, England office. And it was all pretty much set in stone. I'd come over to visit the office. I presented to the office. And on my way home, I like did, did a little pit stop in Florence. And when I left, I was, I cried the whole way home. And mm-hmm. I still, that wasn't a loud enough wake up call to be like, this is where you want to be. I still kept on with the corporate job. And then I said to them, I'm not going to come over, but I ended up staying in Toronto. And then I lost my job with COVID. And on the, on the side, I was saving because I was like, I do want to move to Italy, but I don't know how I would make it work there. So I started having a little bit of a savings account to move to Italy because that was my dream. And then COVID hit, I did the coaching and I stayed home for a year and tried to figure out, okay, well, if I went abroad, how could I make money online? Because that's the dream for a lot, a lot of people mm-hmm. um, to be able to pick up and go wherever. And now with so many people working remotely, I was just like, Hey, I need to like, I've got time now I can, I can figure out how to do this. A year passed year time goes by so quickly now, doesn't it? So, <laughs> and a year passed and COVID was still around. And I was like, well, this situation isn't changing. I have a passport that allows me to live over there. I'm just going to go. And I moved in May to Amsterdam for a month because I didn't, I don't, yes, I have family in Italy, really only kind of one cousin and they live in a quite remote rural area. So I didn't know where in Italy to go. I I just knew I wanted to get to Europe. So I came to Amsterdam for a month. I had friends there. Um, I even thought about getting a job there if I really like needed it. And then um, from there, I had a friend invite me to a birthday party in Italy. And that started what became my experiment of responding like a generator is supposed to, to what came up on my path. So on the side, I've been doing human design readings, but I've been moving very much a lot, like almost every week since then. Um, And it's been too much. Like it's been exhausting it's been amazing. It's just been a roller coaster of emotions, of learnings. But yeah, and I think I was really lucky to see parts of the world when they weren't as busy. So I think a part of me was like, I got to go here and I got to go there. And I'd meet someone and they'd say, you should go here. And I'd be like, okay, I'm going to go there. And so it was a very like, like kind of an adventure spirit type of summer. And now um, I'm trying to figure out where to go next. It's like really a practice in surrender of kind of trusting that the next steps will be revealed to me when I'm ready, because oftentimes I have no idea where I'm going to live the next day. So yeah, that, that's happened quite a few times. Like I've booked flights and hotels the night before countless times. So I'm trying now to figure out, I want to go back to Italy. Um, right now I'm in Portugal because there's quite a big digital nomad um, community here. And one of the things that I'm really trying to find is a sense of community, but also a place where I can, yeah, like focus on my business. Like even just saying that is like rare for me, you know, like I never even Mm -hmm. thought of this as a business or myself as like an entrepreneur, like that's even a weird like title to give myself. But here I found there were lots of them. There are lots of people doing this type of digital nomad lifestyle. So I'm here for a month, which is the longest I've stayed anywhere. 
And um, yeah, we'll see where it takes me, but I do want to stay over here for quite a long time for as long as I can. Yeah. And I'm not opposed to, to finding a job and, and things of that nature, but I'm really lucky that the human design readings has been enough to, to kind of help me make this a little bit longer than I ever expected it to be. Yeah. Yeah. Like what, what a life to be traveling and to each week for me, someone who likes to plan things out, it sounds, it sounds really anxiety oh, um, it, it provoking has at first, <laughs> but at the same time, like once you're in that situation, it's kind of like, all right, this is where we're, we're at and we're going to go for it. And it's really allowed you, I don't think a lot of people get the privilege to, um, experiment with so many different places they kind of just set up their life somewhere and then they're like this is where we're going to stay and travel around and me and my partner were kind of like where do we want to live and we have to like go look at areas you know you've really been just like here's this place here's this place it just it's a really wonderful experience and the idea of just surrendering and and kind of I'm assuming to do that you also have to travel really light like not oh, having so much this clutter is the thing and is packing. I've, 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 I haven't. So this, this, oh, is why, okay. <laughs> this is why it's like the, like if I have to take that suitcase one more place, like it is, oh, no. I did not, I did not. And now I'm, I'm lucky because um, like it's been quite mild weather and I've got to figure out where I'm going to be longer term so I can buy like winter clothes. But I didn't do it well because I never intended, I didn't know how this whole thing would play out. Like I literally, I left for that month in Amsterdam and a lot of people were like, what's your plan? And I was like, I don't know. And I look back now and I, so there are moments where I get really mad at myself for being like, how could you have not had a plan? Like, why did you, why did you not plan this out better? But then I'm like, it was what it was. You know what I mean? Like, and it, it is a lesson in surrender. It's a lesson in trust of, like and also a lesson in um really learning to listen to the inner voice learning to trust intuition knowing like i I, this place isn't the right place i've got to go knowing okay i feel really drawn i'm going to trust that so it's that's for me is what i'm like strengthening i feel is like learning to listen and honor and trust that inner voice Mm mm-hmm yeah. And you're, you're strong enough to handle what you're doing right now. That's certainly true. Like it's, yeah, I think it's we, been, there's been some low points. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. 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 I don't, yeah. It's kind of easy to hear for the life you're going in for me on the outside, be like, Oh, it must be amazing. But of course yeah. there's struggles for it too, but that's that, difficult. You know, you're growing from it for sure. Yeah. And that there's another thing, like, sorry, we're getting into a whole bit of tangent. You need to include yeah. this in the, the episode, but, um, even just with the time that we're in with COVID of like, there, there's a part of me that's like, I shouldn't be doing this or I shouldn't be sharing this because my friends at home, like they're not traveling. And I, I had an aunt that was supposed to come to Italy and she was like, I don't feel safe yet. And then I'm here, I am like going all over. And it's a very strange feeling for me. Is it like, you know, should I not be posting these things because it's kind of unfair for those that don't feel safe to do this and Mm -hmm. yeah that that's been really weighing on me heavily um and then also like just doing it alone as a female I think that's something that eventually I want to speak more about as well um I'm sure that could be scary yeah yeah so yeah we'll see we'll see how it goes but it's been it's been an experience it's been an adventure (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. I think looking back you will and I think you already are very happy that you've done this but when you when you talk about like should I be posting this should I be sharing these things it's your life right that's that's right right right, right. um and I think your journey you're going to be able to share a lot of wisdom from it and your posts are probably helping again a lot more people than you know and people that can't go out sometimes it's nice to see people traveling and doing the things that you're doing and it can inspire others to maybe yeah. do the same or take their own adventures even if it's not traveling to Italy and going to different places each week it's taking the risk in their own life so yeah it's, it's a similar that. yeah it's a very some of the responses I've gotten I've been very similar to when I first came out about bulimia it was like you know this this is helping me or this is inspiring me. And it doesn't have to be the same story because I think 
none of us have the same story, but all of us have the same feelings or the same human experience that we can relate to. So it doesn't matter what it is that you're sharing. If it's true, it's from the heart. There's this chance that someone might resonate with it and they'll get from it, whatever it is that they need to get. But um, yeah, yeah. It's just still, it's about just like owning the, who you are and, and sharing that, you know, it relates back to that one, one thing you spoke about, but. Yeah. It's a lifelong journey, right? <laughs> to own yes. who you are. Always yes. got to relearn how to do that. Um, but anyway, uh, so we can find you on Instagram. Uh, is there anything else you want people to know about you? Like anything you're offering right now or anything like that? No, no. I'm <laughs> the, the little thing that I'm doing that I'm just like, I, it brings me a lot of joy is that I am beginning to share kind of the lessons throughout this time. And um, I'm, I, it's a, like a blog I've created called like Expedition of the Heart, which has a whole meaning behind why I've called it that. But um, if they care to follow along on that, because I, I really enjoy writing. So that's like, you know, if they, if I can like put that out into the world and someone wants to, to read it, that's, that'd be cool. So yeah, I would share mm-hmm. that. I have that and that's on my website if they want to okay. read along like the, the lessons that I'm kind of integrating and, and I feel that I'm ready to share. Um, I post every Friday. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I want to learn about that. I want to read that. So I will be signing up. <laughs> okay. Well, mm-hmm. thank you so much for sharing. You've been a wonderful light on this episode. And, and you too. We covered, I know that we wanted to talk a lot about human design, but we covered so much more than that. So I think people really enjoy it and get yeah. a lot of value from it. Yeah. And thank you for doing your work because when I like tiptoed into like eating disorder recovery, you were the only account solely focused on bulimia and i just think it was so it's so important because yeah like it is a facet of eating disorders that just needs so much more attention and yeah the work that you're doing is just so important and i just give you like all the praise and your newsletter is always spot on with your insights and yeah your voice is very much needed in this space yeah thank you molly i appreciate that Okay, to everyone listening at home, we're going to leave you guys now. Thank you. (laughs) Hey, if you like this episode, you have to come check out the Binge Breakers Recovery course. If you're trying to recover from bulimia and you're sick of doing it alone and you feel like you've tried a lot of traditional therapies and it's not working with you, come join the course. Go to bingebreakers.com slash recovery dash course.